How does John describe the crucifixion? That's what we're going to talk about today in John 19. Well, we are at the crucifixion again. I have to tell you, I'm kind of glad to be going on to Acts next. I'm looking, I don't know, every time we hit the crucifixion, it it just is heart-wrenching. Every way you look at it, I'm eager to learn about the early church, too. So it says, Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. Now, I think, and this is bad, so flogging, not good. I'm not saying flogging is good. What they did is they tortured a person. And I think the reason Pilate did this, because he said, wait a minute, didn't Pilate just think he was innocent? I think what he thought is if I just beat the living daylights out of this guy and make him look like a mess, the Jews will look at him and say, okay, okay, um, you know, too far. You know, I'll be the bad guy. I'll take the hit on this, but too far. You went too far and, okay, we're, we're done. He's punished enough. In some weird way, I think he thought he was maybe saving Jesus' life by doing this. I mean, bizarre way to do it, but I think that was true. They put on the crown of thorns and then a purple robe and said to him, Hail, King of the Jews. So when I stayed in the old city of Jerusalem, we got weekends off on my dig and we would go to Jerusalem or tour around, but I was so obsessed with Jerusalem and primarily and only the old city of Jerusalem. I spent all my time I could there. There was only, as far as I could tell, one women's bathroom in the entire old city of Jerusalem, and it was at the Basilica of Ecce Homo, and it is a convent from the Sisters of Zion. They had a place where you could sleep for, I think it was $2 a night, shower, they gave you breakfast in the morning, The nuns were a French order of nuns, and French was terrible, but they were a hoot. I'm going to tell you one story that is outside this Bible uh, story, but I was there for the 4th of July, and one of the nuns wrote to a sister who was in the United States and said, hey, we have a bunch of Americans who come every weekend and stay with us. Could you bring back something special? And so they talked to us, and they said, you come back for the 4th of July. Oh, okay. So we come back from the 4th of July because there's um, a top part of this church where you can actually walk around and just, I used to do this all the time, view the old city of Jerusalem. Oh no, it pulsed to me, you know, I, it was just weird. And so we were up there and the nuns had popcorn, fireworks. It was a time of relative peace, so you could put fireworks up and beer. So the nuns drank the beer, we ate the popcorn, and I set off the fireworks. <laughs> and we had our own 4th of July thing. And we had spent so much time, my friends and I, spent so much time with the nuns. We got to know them as much as best as we could. They didn't speak much English. And the reason this convent is known as the Ecce Homo convent is because it's named for Pilate's speech, which comes now in John 19.5. So like I said, they put the crown of thorns, a purple robe. They mocked him, said, hail, king of the Jews. And they brought him out. And in Pontius Pilate says, look, I still don't find him guilty. And so he comes out wearing the crown of thorns, the purple robe. He's been beaten to a pulp. And Pontius Pilate says, hold the man. Like, look at this man. Look at him. That is Ecce Homo. Behold the man. So this church is where that happened. And I got to walk around. I mean, people got to walk around, but I got to walk around down there and take a look. You know, when tourists weren't around, I could just spend a little bit of time. And I thought, wow, you know, my thought again was like, wow, Jesus was here. And this is where they did this cruelty to him, the crown of thorns. Boy, man's inhumanity to man, right? I'm not thinking of godly things, but I kept thinking of Jesus and what is about to happen next. So the chief priests and the officers cried out, crucify him. And Pilate's like, take him yourself. You crucify him. I don't find guilt in him. And he's like, we can't. We don't have laws to do that. We can't make him die. He made himself the son of God, you know, the Messiah. And when Pilate heard this, it says he was even more afraid. And I don't know if he was afraid because he thought, well, what if this is the son of God? Because to a Roman, a son of God, is the child of Tiberius, 
right? You know, and that's that's who the son of God is. Is it is he more worried because it's going to bring an uprising? Is it more worrisome that this is a huge religious thing that he has no business knowing anything about? He doesn't even know now what to do. So he entered his headquarters again and said to Jesus, where are you from? You know, like, I think Jesus is trying so hard. Give me something that I can let you go. Where are you from? Will you not speak to me? Do you not know? I could let you go. Or I could crucify you. And Jesus would say, you would have no authority over me unless it had been given to you from above. Therefore, he who delivered me over to you has the greater sin. Is that going to be the temple structure who brought Jesus to him? Is it going to be to Judas who brought Jesus to the high temple structure? You know, but he's basically saying, you're just the finishing act here. So then Pilate sought to release him, but then they cried out, if you release him, you're not Caesar's friend. You know, that they're, they're holding that in his bag. Like, you know, everyone tries to be persuasive. Clearly, we're not persuading you because we talk about how important it is to us that you crucify him. So fine, we'll say something that's important to you. Your ruler, your king, he'll, you're no friend of him. You're going to make an enemy. And 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 because anyone who makes himself a king is a, is an opponent to Caesar. So Pilate heard these words, brought Jesus down, sat down, he sat down, uh, Pilate, on the judgment seat called the stone pavement. It's where you make big decisions. It, the day of preparation for Passover, it's about the sixth hour. There are things that have to happen. And so he said to the Jews, behold your king. And they cried out, crucify him away with him and he goes am i supposed to crucify your king he's giving him one last chance and they say oh we have no king but caesar so he delivered him to be crucified they are swearing this allegiance they're sort of stepping up allegiance to caesar above what Pilate is doing like to say hey i don't know about you but we have no other kings than caesar you know they're they're digging that knife in because the last thing Pilate wants, next to rebellion, is to look bad as he doesn't put a king usurper to death. Okay, so then it's set for Jesus to be crucified. They take Jesus and went out. He's holding his own cross. He's carrying it to the place called the place of the skull, which in Aramaic, which in Aramaic is Golgotha. I think in Greek is Calvary. Aren't we glad that churches are named Calvary instead of Golgotha? And like I said, in Jerusalem, there are two places. One is the Protestant place and the other is the Catholic place that Helena, the mother of Constantine, found in Jerusalem. And I got to see both of them. And one looks a little bit more plausible than the other just because of the location was so public because they want everybody to see a man being crucified because the message is same thing with like any public execution. See, you do this. This is what happens to you. Don't be like this. And they want it to be as public as possible. And so they carried carried his cross through the streets of Jerusalem. First of all, this is what they call the Via Dolorosa, the way of the cross. Where did Jesus step? And I took the way of the cross a few times. Like, why am I doing this if I'm an atheist? But they each have placards on them. This is where Jesus fell the first time. This is where, you know, this happened and that happened. You can go through the whole thing and watch it. I think I heard that Rome has a recreation of what it was with the way of the cross, too. So probably they could see it more often and have more people see it. So they put on his cross, and this was standard. What you did is you put the name and what this person did wrong, essentially. And so Pilate had on this, wrote this inscription, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. People wondered, is this... Pilate admitting he believes he's the king of the Jews? I don't, I don't think so, because I think he would have said something else. This was the crime that Jesus was being put to death for. And so it was written in Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. Those are going to be the common languages of the time. And so the chief priest said to Pilate, you write king of the Jews on there. Just say that this is, that the man said he was the king of the Jews. And, you know, because they're now mad because it says the thing that Jesus said. And they're saying no. And Pilate's like, I wrote what I wrote. Just leave me out of this. 
Pilate just wants to be left alone. And so when the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his garments, they divided it into four parts, and the tum- tunic was a single piece. And so they, you know, we're going to cut in four pieces, you know, stuff was valuable back then and people were poor. And these soldiers were maybe Roman soldiers, but probably Herod soldiers. And so they probably could use a good set of clothes. They'd be bloody by now, right? They'd cast lots for the clothes, which was a fulfillment of scripture. They divide my garments among them and my clothing for casting lots. This is Psalm twenty-two, eighteen. And that's what I'm saying. This is impossible because look at how many tools I have and how many cross-references and computer nerd things I have. And we can look all this up and say, oh, yeah, there it is. But in Jesus' time, this is like from the top of your head. You are referencing scripture and prophecy and things that Jesus, as a normal man, could not have arranged to become the Messiah. There's no human being who could have arranged all of this. So they cast lot for his clothes. It also means that while it's nice to imagine that Jesus was on the cross with some sort of a loincloth or some kind of clothing at all, he was probably not. You don't have anything left. They have stripped you of everything. So the soldiers did these things. There at the cross were his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, Mary Magdalene. I said, someday I'm going to do a whole podcast on all the Marys and get them all straightened out. People say the Bible was written by fake people, you know, made up centuries later. If they had made up the New Testament, they would have written different people's names into these stories because it is very confusing. Two Judases, now like 13 different Marys. It's very confusing. So Jesus saw his mother and the disciple who he loved. You notice that John says that, I think, because he's not trying to say, and then Jesus looked into my eyes. Jesus told me to do this. I think John is trying to remove himself from the story as being any focus in this story. This story is about Jesus. We are witnesses to it. We were a part of it, but this story is not about us. And so it says, so he said, woman, and again, this isn't like it's the same woman as before. This isn't a bad woman. This is like, madam, it's a very honorary woman. Behold your son, pointing to John. And, and said to the disciple, behold your mother. Meaning, this is now your mother. Care for her like she was your own mother. And at that point, the disciple took her into his own home. And so people ask the question at this point, if we think that Jesus had other brothers and sisters, why didn't they take Mary into their home? And the big theory is, is that these disciples are not yet followers of Jesus. James will become the head of the church in Jerusalem, but not yet. And so we think that maybe that was why they didn't go, she didn't go to their house. Now, on the Catholic side of things, they would probably say, see, this is why when we say brothers and sisters, it was meant more as a philosophical brother and sister, not an actual. So, you know, it's interesting to see at this point. So then after this, Jesus, knowing that this was fulfilled, completed, over with, he says, thirst. So a jar of sour wine was brought, and then a sponge of wine with hyssop branch was kind of held up to his mouth, you know, like pat, pat, pat around his mouth, and he received some of the sour wine. Why did he do that? Because that was his last moment, and he was had one more thing to say. And what he said is, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. He wasn't killed. He gave it up. And I, met, and I spent all this day trying to remember, memorize the Greek word. And I'm telling you, my brain is so filled with virus, I can't even remember the name. But if you look up that word, that <laughs> I can't say and I can't remember, it means finished. If you got a bill, it would mean paid for, like perfected, like ended, finished as a race, that kind of word. And Jesus said it was finished. And at that point, what they do is it was a day of preparation. We need people to die quickly, to be blunt, because people don't want that body to stay up there all Sabbath. So the Jews asked Pilate to break their legs because essentially you have a little platform to stand on. But when your legs are broken, you can no longer stand on that platform. 
And I don't want to get gross on this, but essentially the death of crucifixion is um, no longer being able to breathe. And so they go in and they break the feet. The soldiers came and did the first one. And then they went to the other one. And then when they looked, Jesus was already dead. But I'm sure they're wondering, well, wait a minute, how do we know he's really dead? What if he's just faking being dead? Because it was actually quite early for someone to die on the cross. They wanted this to be long and painful. And so they decide what they're going to do is they're going to take a spear and stab it through his side. And it says, out came blood and water. Some people, you know, like to give the medical thing. Oh, it pierced his heart and blood and water came out. But here's the thing. Blood and water? Really? This is my blood? Uh, I'm the water of life? You certainly can't miss that right there. And then John says, he who saw it has borne witness. Meaning, I saw it and I'm telling you what happened. His testimony, my testimony is true, and he knows he is telling the truth so that you may be believed. The whole reason I wrote all this down, I'm writing this book, is so that you might believe. I mean, think of that. Matthew wrote, so that you would understand the prophecy and the fulfillment. And Mark is saying, I am writing this to the believers so that you may be strengthened and know what you believed. And Luke, was writing it to people who were either new believers or not yet believing. And I wrote this so that you might believe, but John is saying this. I am writing this as a testimony from someone who saw this all happen so that you would know and you would believe for these things that took place that the scripture might be fulfilled. He is tying this whole thing together, Matthew and all the scriptures. Not one of his bones were broken. They saw he was dead already. And another scripture said, they will look on him whom they have pierced. And this, like I said, just summarizes everything John was saying. John said from the beginning that he was writing this down so that people could believe. And so then two things happened. Joseph of Arimathea, we learned about him in other gospel, had a plot stone for his family that was yet unused. What they do is they'd Rich people would pay these stone crafters to dig a hole into a cave built for them. And I saw, like I said, I was at this place and it has like a little ledge where you would put the body. So it's just a cave and then there's like a little table ledge for a person there. And so Joseph of Arismathea, who was part of the Sanhedrin, who was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly because he was afraid of the Jews, but the temple structure, even though he was a part of the temple structure, went to Pilate and said, hey, I take his body. And Pilate gave him permission. And so he came and took the body. Nicodemus, we have Nicodemus back again. And he brought 75 pounds. I think they said it was actually would have been 68 pounds in our weight measurement, but 75 pounds of myrrh and aloe. Remember Jesus, when he was born, got frankincense and myrrh. And we talked about these are gifts for a king gifts for religious purposes, and a gift for a burial. The myrrh was for Jesus' burial and aloe. We know what aloe is. And so they took the body, they bound it in linen. It says that where the place of the crucifixion was, was a garden. And in the garden was this new tomb. And so they put Jesus in there and they had to hurry because again, Sabbath was coming. And since the tomb was close, they laid Jesus here. They didn't want him to go into the beggar's pit. They wanted him to be buried properly. That ends John 20. What I'm going to meditate on is how this story just sets it up from the beginning. Jesus was there from the beginning. John is telling us the story so we may believe. We see from the Holy Spirit from the beginning. We now are going to hear from the Holy Spirit coming soon. John, like I said, had that ability to read the other apostles' writing. He tidies this whole thing up into what this really means. Matthew, the prophecy, Luke and Mark to new believers so they understood what was going on. And now John saying, this is the deeper meaning behind all of it. It isn't secret meaning. It isn't so difficult we can't understand. But I'm tying this all together for you so you get the big picture. Wow. What I'm going to pray about is that my eyes are open, that I can always see the message of God and how God tidies it for us, that 
that God puts it together for us so that we can understand and the most important part, believe. And what I'm going to tell others is these two Sanhedrin members, they're leaders, right? There's 71 of these guys. Two of them are believers. And it makes you think they didn't know each other were followers of Jesus because Nicodemus came in the middle of the night. Now, Joseph of Arimathea, who we never heard of before, except in the other Gospels, says, I have a place to bury him, and goes and talks to Pilate to go get it. What's his career if this word gets out on the line? Did these two secret, powerful men meet at the cross of Jesus, not knowing the other existed as believers in Jesus? Sometimes we're not bold enough to come out and say the words or show other people but it happens. And Jesus brings these two people together who can now understand each other. They can each talk to each other. What a, what a miracle that is. Jesus brings people together. I guess if you had asked me my experience before this podcast started is that, oh yeah, people talked to me about God and Jesus years before. And then my friend brought, you know, talked to me about Jesus, brought me to her pastor and put everything into motion. What this podcast is meaning to me, and now I'm thinking back at it, is why did an atheist insist on going to Saturday school when her dad didn't want her to go? Why did an atheist spend so much time in Jerusalem when, without religion, it held no meaning? It's a neat city. It's historic. It's so cool to see a city that large and that old, but I didn't believe any of it. And then to go stay at this convent where Conscious Pilate says, behold the man. Walk the streets of the Via Dolorosa and see every weekend that I went there, the path of Jesus. Now, I feel like I was pursued for a very long time. I appreciate you listening. Thank you so much. This is really heartbreaking to read yet again. And I hope it holds as much meaning. I hope you see each of the stories and why each of them cover a different topic. 